Isan is born a happy and healthy boy. His mother, Saima, considers him a miracle child, their gift from God after 10 years of trying for a baby. But at seven months old, Isan is brought to the sick kid's emergency department. He was essentially inconsolable. Um, Mom uh, was holding him and flipping between her and dad. And this, based on listening to them, was what he was like most of the time. He couldn't lie down without um, really screaming. He was having difficulty eating or or, uh, breastfeeding. That's Dr. David Malkin, an oncologist and director of the Cancer Genetics Program at SickKids. He can see how exhausted Saima is, how terrified she is for her boy. He can also see what's causing all this, a grapefruit-sized tumor protruding from his aunt's bum. The tumor is sandwiched between his spine and bladder, pressing on his intestines and causing terrible constipation. His aunt's symptoms are already worrying. As the tumor continues to grow, things will only get worse. But the exact nature of the tumor isn't so easy to decipher. Azan's pathologist initially diagnosed it as a soft tissue sarcoma. So a sarcoma is a tumor that's derived from either muscle or bone or cartilage or, or fat. But they're not entirely sure what kind of sarcoma it is. It resembles another rare tumor, but it's not an exact fit. At best, their diagnosis is an educated guess. And that doesn't sit well with David. As an oncologist, not Knowing exactly what you're treating always makes you a bit nervous. So David enrolls him in a study he co-leads called KICS, the Sick Kids Cancer Sequencing Program, one of the world's leading programs of its kind. It's where oncologists bring their most difficult cases, kids susceptible to cancer, kids with aggressive, hard-to-treat cancers, and kids with rare or hard-to-classify tumors. Kix analyzes children's DNA and their tumor's DNA to figure out what's causing the cancer and how to stop it. A patient's DNA might reveal mutations that predispose a child to cancer, while the tumor's DNA might reveal mutations driving the cancer. Like plants and people, tumors have their own genetic code, a blueprint for how they grow and spread. Understanding that genetic code can be key to finding the right treatment. But comprehensive genetic testing like this can take months. And David needs to start treating Azan now. So he starts Azan on chemotherapy. The plan is to shrink the tumor with chemo, then have surgeons remove what's left without damaging any organs. But as the days pass, the tumor doesn't shrink. It gets bigger. And uh, if this thing keeps on growing and is resistant to all the therapy that we're giving, then the end result can only be bad. For Saima, it's devastating. I was uh, so upset that time. And I, uh, my, I, I lose my all hope. I, I went to totally depression. David needs to change course. But he still doesn't know why the treatment isn't working or what exactly Azan's tumor is. And to answer those questions, he needs kicks. You're listening to Sick Kids Versus, where we take you to the front lines in the fight for child health. I'm Hannah Bank, and this is Sick Kids vs. Cancer Genetics. The collective goal of the huge team that works on KICS is to understand better how this type of in-depth genetic analysis can help us better understand our patients' diagnoses, try to help shed some light on why they got cancer, try to take a look at how it is responding to treatment, that's Dr. Anita Villani, a sick kids oncologist and co-lead of the KICS program with David. Anita likes to think of KICS as a pipeline, a step-by-step process that begins with extensive genetic analysis and ends at the molecular tumor board. A group of oncologists, geneticists, genetic counselors, pathologists, and scientists who make treatment recommendations based on the findings. Each week, they come together at sick kids to pool their expertise and review cases from kicks. If cancer is the supervillain, the molecular tumor board is the Avengers, the best of the best, all united by a singular purpose. To help his end, first, 
they need to find the mutation that's driving his cancer. And that job belongs to genome analyst Nisha Kanwar. I look at the DNA of uh, individuals' tumors, um, and that really helps me understand what is the mutation that initiated the tumor. Is there a certain mutation that led to progression or resistance to treatments and things like that? So really the goal is to, to look at a patient's DNA to try and find what caused the cancer. Unlike David, Nisha doesn't see patients and families. She sees genetic code. But the work is personal to her. And the pressure is serious. Her team and their patients depend on her. These are all urgent. These are all essential. Nisha works on a lot of cases, but she still remembers Azan's well. Probably one of the last days I was coming into work before going off on holidays. And it was odd because I was actually working on a different case. And all of the conversation was about this different case. That case is a patient with a rare kidney cancer. But something about that tumor isn't right. It's not behaving like it should. And the mutation that's driving this strange tumor is in a gene called BCOR, which codes proteins. Around that time, Nisha opens Azan's file. And right there, the first thing I see is a BCOR variant. So, you know, you call it a coincidence, serendipity, like whatever you call it. Like it, everybody just had to take a pause and sort of go, you know, how is this happening? This could be it, the very mutation that's driving Azan's cancer. Nisha fires off an email to Anita and her colleagues. This was a Friday. Nisha writes to say, Hi, all. I'm working on this case of infantile sarcoma, and I found a B-Core variant that might be indicative of a B-Core ITD. That one email triggers a flood of excited responses. Dr. Adam Schlein, Kix's clinical research project manager, writes, Mind blown times two. Other colleagues review her work in the scientific literature. There's so few of us at the lab at that point, you know, because it was the end of year and uh, we were double, triple, quadruple checking it to make sure, like, is this, is this real? Just a few days before Christmas, it's confirmed. They've found the unique mutation driving Azan's tumor, the secret to what's made it so resistant to chemo. But Azan's still very sick. And time is of the essence. With this new discovery, Azan's case is now ready for the molecular tumor board. And the excitement in the room is palpable. The idea that what we were doing wasn't working and here was something that the bioinformatics team was giving us that could change the course was really quite exhilarating. We were very exciting, you know, it's sort of like the the thunder that you want to (laughs) reveal to the crowds. Unlike some tumors, there's no targeted treatment for what a Zen has. But what the group does discover is this. It was way more aggressive than the other kind of sarcoma that we initially were thinking or may have been thinking. And with that information in mind, I knew that I would switch his treatment entirely. David wants to use a combination of four chemotherapy drugs, three of which are very aggressive and toxic, which means a greater potential for serious side effects like nausea, anemia, infection, and bleeding. That's the constant battle is how much are you willing to take a child to the edge with the hope of a great response, recognizing that, you know, you could end up with other problems down the road. But with the tumor growing, David isn't left with much choice. I just felt that if for Izan, if we didn't do something pretty dramatic, we're just going to lose the entire game altogether. Izan's parents agree. David begins Izan on the new, more intensive chemo. Days pass. Then something remarkable happens. The tumor begins to shrink. After a couple of cycles, there was no question that physically you could see this tumor was getting smaller. It was felt softer. And then when we did the uh, first imaging MRI, this thing had shrunk by about half of what it had been before we started. Saima can see her son improving too. We were happy and we are getting hope. Now uh, Izan is going to be, you know, well soon. 
David's next question is how long to continue the chemo before surgeons can remove what's left of the tumor. As in so many things in cancer care, it's a precarious balance. As the tumors get exposed to more and more chemotherapy, they start to acquire resistance to that chemotherapy. They get used to it a little bit. So the worry is always there that if you wait too long, yeah, the surgeon goes in and takes it out. But in the meantime, some of these few cells have uh, acquired resistance and they could come back down the road. David decides to continue the chemo for a total of six cycles. With each subsequent round, the tumor continues to shrink. Everything is looking good. Still, the surgery won't be so straightforward. At the time of surgery, there were still potential challenges that the surgeons were concerned about that based on where this tumor was, they could damage nerves to his, for his walking, for his bowel, for his bladder. Azan surgery will be spread over two days. On the first, surgeons will approach the tumor from the front of his body. On the second, from the back. All of this makes Simon nervous. She has visions of her child traumatized by the surgery. Making everything more complicated is the sudden surge of COVID-19. As the disease spreads across Canada, operating rooms start shutting down. So David scrambles to coordinate with surgeons and hospital leadership to get the surgery done quickly. Finally, in the spring of 2020, Azan goes in for surgery. Saima waits outside with her husband, hoping and praying. The KICKS program at SickKids improves outcomes for hard-to-treat pediatric cancers through genetic sequencing. Its success depends on the generosity of partners, like CIBC. We're proud to recognize CIBC as the premier sponsor of the Sick Kids vs. podcast. CIBC has been a champion for Sick Kids for over 30 years and our largest corporate supporter of the Cancer Genetics Program. The bank and its team members genuinely care about making a difference and support the hospital through events like CIBC Miracle Day and an active employee giving and volunteering program. The first day of surgery finishes faster than anyone expects. Better yet, there were no complications, no damage to any of the surrounding organs. The second day is a success too. The surgeons remove whatever is left of the chemo shrunken tumor and Azan begins to heal. In December, 2020, more than eight months after the surgery, I asked David about the last time he saw Azan. But what I remember was quite funny is as I was leaving, I sort of waved and I said a little, bye, Izan, see you next time. And he sort of peeks over his mom's shoulder and gives me a wave of his hand. So uh, <laughs> probably because he knew that, okay, good, I'm out of here. Izan seems to be doing well. He's happy and playful. I'm always scared, but right now the things are very good. It's uh, back to normal and uh, he's uh, very active now. We are always busy with him to, you know, play with him all day. <laughs> Azan is just one of many children whose lives have been saved by Kix. In the four years in which Kix has been active, they've enrolled just under 500 patients, kids, teenagers, and young adults who otherwise had little hope. They've even started to sequence the DNA of adult patients. So just over 80% of the alterations that are identified are potentially actionable. About half of those are patients in which we find an alteration in the tumor cells for which there is a drug that could be, at least in theory, used to target it. About 15%, we find an alteration in their blood, which suggests that they have a genetic predisposition to the cancer. That may not always change or guide us in terms of treatment, uh, but it does tell us that there may be an impact on other family members. And then there's also a smaller group of patients, about 10 to 15 percent, for whom the genetic alteration we see in the sequencing actually changes the diagnosis. In other words, it's working really, really well. So well, in fact, David wants to expand the program so even more children have access to this kind of sequencing and expertise. The KICKS program 
has demonstrated to me and to our colleagues and really around the world that this is the right way, the best way, the most appropriate way to take care of kids with cancer. Every child should have access to kick sequencing and to the potential therapies that can be enabled by a program such as this. Genetics-driven, highly tailored treatment is part of a broader trend in medicine. Here at SickKids, we call it precision child health. It's a vision of a different kind of healthcare, one informed by what makes each patient unique, from their genetic code to their postal code. But this kind of individualized treatment can be expensive, a problem David knows all too well. So the actual cost per patient, if you will, um, once you've done everything and put all the analyses together, still approaches close to $10,000 here. All of the funding for Kicks comes from donors. As this program evolves, as we offer it to more and more children and young adults, that we need funding to maintain that. And the funding is substantial. But at the end of the day, saving lives is worth it. From SickKids Foundation, this is SickKids Versus. Thanks for listening. If you want to support work like this, visit sickkidsfoundation.com slash podcast to donate. And if you like this podcast, please subscribe and rate us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to SickKids Versus. SickKids Versus is produced by me, Hannah Bank, Colin J. Fleming, Neil Parmar, Jasmine Budak, and Jillian Savigny. This episode was written by Colin J. Fleming. Sound design and editing by Quill. Production support by Aisha Barmania. Dr. David Malkin is the CIBC Children's Foundation Chair in Child Health Research. For photos, transcripts, sources, show notes, and lists of donors, as well as staff who help make this breakthrough possible, visit sickkinsfoundation.com slash podcast.